All right, well, let's get started. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us on a Friday night for Trendsetters in Creative Industries. I'm Laura Highlanday, and I'm Trinity 06 Fuqua 12, and I'm also the incoming Duke Asian Alumni Alliance National Chair and the Vice President of Marketing for Authority Brands. Everyone is welcome to keep your cameras on during this session because we're always excited to see you, but please keep your mics on mute. Um, if you have any questions as we go through the program, anything you want to ask Gary or Alan or just discuss as a group, please drop them into the chat. I'm so pleased to be the moderator of this session and like such a big fan of Gary and Alan. So like a little bit of fangirl here, but it's awesome to get to moderate this panel. So I would love to welcome our panelists. They will tell you more about themselves, but just the overview is I've got Gary Yee, class of 2017, founder of digital media platform, Art Drunk and Alan Mack, class of 98, founder of multiple fashion and apparel brands, including Version Tomorrow and Public School. So we are going to kick off by letting each panelist share a little bit about their career journey, and then I'll join them for the conversation. So Gary, if you wanna take us briefly through your journey, we'd love to hear it. Of course. Hello everyone, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, so I, as Laura mentioned, I'm Gary. I graduated from Duke in 2017. Uh, I studied art history and economics, and now I run the media platform Art Trunk, which is meant to promote contemporary art to the masses. Uh, so basically how I got my start was uh, studying art history in, in college. I was really passionate about art and art history, of course. Um, but over time, I realized I really needed a, a way to express myself outside of that ac academic setting. And so that's kind of where Art Trunk came in. Uh, started as an Instagram really nothing much, didn't think about it. It's really just a diary for myself to document all these, the artworks that I was seeing, uh, usually in New York, I mean, even around Durham and uh, the Research Triangle. Uh, but over time, I realized, you know, this, there's actually a lot of opportunity where people are resonating with what I'm doing with Art Drunk, the way I'm writing about art, uh, but the way, you know, it became a platform for introducing uh, artists from all over the world. That path to, to where I am today is a bit more complicated though, because I think especially as an Asian American, uh, I was really encouraged by my parents to take on a more quote unquote traditional path. And so when I went to Duke, uh, my intention was actually to go down the banking consulting path uh, as many of my friends did as well. And so, you know, the first few internships that I had in school were in, in finance at an asset management firm and then in tech uh, at a, now, now a ride-sharing startup, but um, ultimately I graduated and worked in fintech, very Fortune 500, very corporate type uh, company. Uh, you know, really loved the experience, worked with an incredible executive team where I learned a lot of business skills, but at the same time, you know, that was a job in Philadelphia. Uh, all my free time was spent going to New York, going to art galleries and museums in New York, uh, even flying to art fairs around the U.S. And so, I think there, there came a point about two years ago in 2019 when after about a year and a half after graduating and on the job, there are a lot of opportunities that came in for Art Drunk to travel abroad to Hong Kong, uh, Seoul, the Middle East, uh, Amsterdam, all in one trip. And so I think there's that opportunity coming together all in one month. I decided, you know, why not take the leap? People seem to be enjoying what Art Drunk is doing. And, you know, I, I saw a huge gap in the type of content that I wanted to see as someone who loves art and someone who wants to share art with, with everyone. Uh, and so that's kind of where it's taking me today. That's an amazing journey. When I was in college, we didn't even have Instagram. So it's good that I didn't try to start a business on it. Alan, I know that you, you graduated Duke even before me. So why don't you take us through your journey? Absolutely. Hi everyone, thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you know, similar to, to Gary, I, I studied econ while I was at Duke, and uh, you know, for for me, it was sort of that traditional path, right? Where I think, as an Asian American, you're you sort of have a, a predefined path of, of where your parents expect you to to go, sort of what what uh, career choices to to make. For me, actually growing up, uh, I've always been in, in, into the arts. I used to paint, still do a lot of photography, but 
when I was in high school, you know, it was my dream to, to be the next Herb Ritz. I wanted to actually be a fashion photographer, um, believe it or not. Um, the sort of the downside of that was, you know, this is all sort of pre-internet, pre-Instagram, pre all this kind of stuff. And, you know, around that time, I just decided, well, if I want to eat, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to be a fashion photographer. It just was one of those career paths that seemed like it was, would have been very difficult. Um, you know, during, during that time in the nineties, I could, you know, pretty much count on one hand, the number of like top fashion photographers that, that were out there. And uh, not to say that that couldn't have been me, but I just sort of played the odds, right? I, I did, I did the math in my head and I played the odds and I'm like, this probably doesn't make the most sense. So yeah, I mean, I, I studied econ sort of, you know, gearing myself up towards a career in, in, in finance, um, did research, did, did internships doing equities research throughout college. And um, yeah, and inter interestingly enough, I, uh, I actually almost moved to Chicago to go work for Anderson Consulting. Uh, sort of bailed on, on that on that opportunity two weeks before graduation because I, I woke up one day and I was like, you know what? I don't want to go to Chicago. I want to stay in New York. So I bailed on that job and basically decided to, you know, start all over from scratch and 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 sort of find a new job while I was in, in, New, in New York after I moved back after graduation. Um, but for, you know, but I've, I've always still sort of enjoyed what I did, but at the same time, being in finance wasn't terribly satisfying. After school, sorry, I, I did equities research and I worked for you know, a boutique research firm as well as a technology-oriented orient, investment bank. Um, but yeah, I, I never really fully enjoyed it, but sort of deep down, I've always been a nerd at heart and really into technology. And you know, as I was doing equities research, I always thought to myself, well, geez, wouldn't it be great to work in technology, right? But at the same time, I didn't want to move from New York. And, you know, this is around the sort of late 90s, early noughts. And there really weren't very many technology companies in New York. But lo and behold, Headhunter called me up uh, representing this enterprise software company and, and asked me, and they're like, do you want to join us and, and you know, do competitive intelligence for this enterprise software company? I was like, and I can stay in New York. And they were like, yeah, you can stay in New York. I'm like, great, sign me up. So I joined this software company just sort of as a leap of faith. And, um, you know, it was, it was really fun. And one of the things that, that I enjoyed about that was, you know, this idea of this, of a product cycle where you concept out a product, you, you know, do the research in terms of the market opportunity, you go ahead and spec it out, develop it, market it, sell it, and actually deliver it. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. And that was something that I never really got when I was doing equities research, right? When you're doing equities research, your, your, your product is really information. And, and for me, it was every single quarter, you listen to your conference calls, you update your Excel, you, you, you update your Excel sheets, your financial models, and then you write your research reports. Um, problem is, is it was just like a rinse and repeat type of thing where every single quarter I was doing the same thing over and over again. And ultimately that wasn't very satisfying to me. Um, so part of, part of that was, you know, being at the, at the software company, that was really enjoyable. Um, but then 9-11 hit. Um, right when 9-11 hit, sort of the entire industry was completely paralyzed. Well, actually the whole entire world was paralyzed at the time. And companies as a whole, they just weren't really into spending multi-million dollars to, you know, implement these, these enterprise level e-commerce e type systems that, that from the company that I was working at. Um, right around the same time, IBM was sort of introducing software similar to ours, but they gave it away for free, right? They were interested in selling services. They were interested in selling hardware. The company I work for, we were a pure play software company. Well, all of a sudden you've got a company like IBM who's offering the software, which is comparable to ours for free. Well, guess what? You really can't compete with free. So, you know, 9-11 plus the, the competitive environment, that put the company that I, that I was working for out of business. And, you know, for me, sort of it was, it was a, a soul search of, you know, what was I, gonna, what was I going to do after that? Um, you know, was I going to go back into finance? Was I going to go into consulting? Was I going to stay within the software industry? And, you know, funny enough for me, I, I grew up in the, in the apparel industry. My parents had been in the industry since the late seventies. 
And it's something that they really never wanted me to ever come back to, right? They never wanted me to be a part of that. They wanted me to, to do better than they did. And, you know, from their perspective, being in finance was something that was better. Um, but again, it's like, I love the product cycle. So against their wishes, I came into the fashion industry. And, you know, when I first started out, I was just doing sourcing production for, you know, doing private label type development for different fashion brands, like advanced contemporary young designer brands, also doing stuff for, you know, different department stores like Barney's, Bergdorf, Spindles, Saks at the time. And, you know, from there, I started up my own women's brands and, you know, I had two quite successful women's brands. Um, and then I sort of ventured out and st started seeking menswear opportunities because I just kind of felt like menswear was going to have a moment. And, um, you know, around that time, I, I through a mutual friend, met up with the, um, the founders of the, of the streetwear brand public school and ultimately decided to partner with them. And we've had a really amazing, amazing ride. We've, you know, won the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund. We've won multiple other CFDA awards. And it's been really exciting. And that sort of fulfilled that, that creative side of me where you know, I always grew up with fashion in my blood. I've always been into art and here I am. It's like, I'm kind of living it, but at the same time, it's like I'm blending the, the business analytic side of, you know, the research side from my first career as, as well as my second career in enterprise software, but also blending that with, with my passion of being in an industry where I actually have a product. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for any aspiring MBAs who may be in the audience, the piece of advice from these two who studied econ at Duke is really what Alan said. You can't compete with free. So there's there's your free <laughs> business lesson right there. You're welcome. Um, you know, one thing that I think is interesting about both of you is that you both studied econ, you know, parental pressure, probably like the practicality of it. You both went into more traditional business paths and then you both pivoted from that. And I know that um, there may be people joining us tonight who may be interested in doing the same or have wondered about doing the same. So when you think about what you did like tactically and practically to kind of make that, a re and I know you touched on it both in some of your stories, what you did to make that kind of a reality for you and really make that pivot like full-time into another, another career path, especially one like the arts where there's you know, not so much structure compared to finance. Um, what are some of the things that you did that you'd, that you think worked well for you or maybe that worked well at the time, but you know, now, like in the age of Instagram, you know, would work differently. So I think people would love to hear some of that advice. Alan, if you want to give a few few tips and pointers, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for anyone who's looking to, to make that pivot, um, you know, in, in my case, I had the luxury of sort of leaning on, a, on, on my parents because they've been in the business. Um, and, and so I've been able to learn from, from their mistakes from me growing up. But at the same time, it's like, if I didn't have them, it's like, where, where would I be able to have the knowledge or who would I be able to ask? And now that I'm more established in terms of what I do, like I try to, I, I'm, I'm very generous with my time with people, or I try to be very generous with my time. And, you know, the best advice that I could always give to anyone is really just like, reach out, try to expand your network, talk to as many people as you possibly can. And, you know, really don't be shy about asking. And I think it, people would be really surprised how generous people are, you know, with, with their time. And I think as Asians, we've sort of grown up with this idea that I don't want to, I don't want to burden someone. I don't want to ask them questions. I don't want to bother them. Right. But, you know, it's funny enough, I, I was reading an article earlier today, um, you know, about Asian Americans and, and sort of hitting the ceiling in, in Wall Street type firms. And one of the things that was highlighted was, you know, Asians have a really hard time seeking out mentors, right? And when you have a really hard time seeking out mentors, it's like you're, you're, you want to pivot into something or you want to challenge yourself and do something different. But if you don't have a mentor to guide you, you're, you're kind of going it on your own. And you know, I, I think that that's one of the things that we have to collectively understand is you don't need to go at it on your own. There's going to be people that are there who are really open to, to helping you. And, and, and that's part of the reason why, you know, I try to be really generous with my time was because growing up or, you know, sort of earlier on in my career, I never had the guts to ask anyone for anything. So here I am, it's like, 
I'm charting my own path. And if I'm making mistakes, well, it's on me. If you know, I succeed, I don't even know whether or not I fully succeeded because no one's told me that I've succeeded. Um, and I think that that's, that's it, right? It's like seek out those mentors and find different people who can, who can help you on that, on that journey. Gary, what advice do you have for someone who might be thinking of exploring who wants to make a pivot fully into another industry, especially in the arts? Yeah, I mean, I definitely echo Alan early on. You know, I didn't come from a background where, especially for the art world, traditionally, a lot of the people who work in this industry come from wealthier backgrounds. Their parents collected art uh, or maybe their parents are curators or somehow involved in the arts already. Uh, I didn't have any of that. And so I really leaned on Instagram, as you've mentioned, as a way to find a community uh, to connect with artists. And, you know, especially when I was in college, uh, I think artists and even just art world people were so curious that a college student was interested in the art market, was interested uh, in what artists were doing. And so I was able to take advantage of that to meet a few people early on purely through Instagram, but then, you know, once those interactions became in real life interactions, uh, started, you know, meeting their friends of friends or people, they would introduce me to others. And so the network would grow that way. Uh, but in terms of, you know, making the leap to actually do, to, to, to pivot industries or to pursue a passion, I think for me, I always wanted to rush into it. You know, I, I always felt this is my passion. I have to do this. Uh, but it still took you know, three, four years of starting Art Drunk just on the side before it was at a point when I could actually pursue it full time. Uh, and even now, I still look back sometimes and think, wow, I really learned a lot from the executives at my old company. Could I have learned more if I had just stayed six more months? Um, I think I left at the right time in terms of the opportunities, but there, there are a lot of, you know, gaps in my skill set that I, I wish I had learned. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, my advice would be to take your time too. I, I think there's, if it really is something you're passionate about, you know, I think the media really likes to play up these stories of individuals or millennials, especially who become millionaires when, by the time they're 24, 25, or become billionaires by the time they're 30. And I think there's actually countless more stories of people finding new careers at 40 or 50 even. And so if it's something that you're really, really passionate about, I really believe that I think over the course of time, uh, as long as you're, you know, still one foot in uh, while you have a job elsewhere, while you're still doing something else, you'll eventually find a way to, to be able to pursue it fully. And I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the fact that obviously this is a, a one of the panels at the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance inaugural symposium. So I would, and obviously we're all the we have many things in common, I'm sure, although I do not like have the eye or the, the creative talent that either of you have. But we're all Duke alums, we're Asian Americans. So I would love to know, like while you both work in, you know, such niche, such a niche, very hard to get into, even with, I mean, obviously it's advantageous to certainly as Gary pointed out to have like, you know, family wealth or like family that's connected in that industry as well. Um, but certainly a hard industry to get into. And do you feel that you know, working in the arts and being Asian American and your heritage in particular has had a, any sort of impact or, you know, is it just kind of equally difficult to succeed full time in, you know, such a hard industry like the arts? Yeah, I think I can speak to that first. So definitely, initially, I thought there's massive barriers that I would never be able to break into the art world. A lot of, you know, what I do today is video content for art galleries where I'm actually producing, filming, editing the videos. Uh, but a lot of these ideas I already had almost three, four years ago uh, when most galleries weren't even thinking about video yet. And a lot of the people I was pitching to were, were galleries in New York. And I really felt, you know, I, I, I don't think it's as black and white as they didn't want to work with me because I'm Asian, but I really didn't feel that I was getting the support that I needed to, to really pursue this type of thing. Uh, whereas I think the real opportunities that came in for my business were over the past two years when I started traveling to Asia. Uh, and immediately, for example, one of my biggest clients now is a gallery in Korea, uh, where I meet, you know, upon meeting them after a couple of times, like the first time they, they wanted to start filming a documentary. That's just one example. Whereas, you know, another one is um, I there's this one client in, in New York. I really like him. Uh, the gallery is run by this, this German guy, but the director there that I know is a Japanese guy. 
Uh, I think he's in his forties, but every time I see him, you know, he's so excited that there's like another Asian in the art world where he's all, always joking, Asian pride, you know, like he, he's like so excited just to, to have this community. And he's the one who brought me into the gallery to start working with them. Uh, it's not someone I intended to, to work with when I first met him, but over the course of developing that relationship uh, over you know a year or two, eventually the opportunity came where I think I really found that support through these individuals and, and, uh, and galleries. Alan, do you want to share any experiences or any insights you have around how being Asian Americans affected your career? Yeah, I think yeah. When, when I think about what, what it is that I'm doing now, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stereotypes that exist within the fashion industry and, you know, being Asian, being Chinese, you know, typically what occurs is, you know, they, they don't see me as being sort of like on the front lines of things, right? It's always, you know, most Asian folks within the fashion, with, within the fashion world are sort of at the factory level or doing sort of the, the labor or the manufacturing side of things rather than these, you know, the, the, the more value add type of stuff on the creative side or on the business side. You know, for, for me with public school, part of what I do is like, I run the company number one, but number two, it's like, I handle all of our business development. I handle our collaborations and whatnot. And yes, granted, it's like, I also do oversee production and product, but you know, the way that I'm doing this, it's, it's from a, from a more sales or more create more of a creative way rather than just strictly just you know, being a bean counter and, and, and figuring out how to like drill down costs from the product and just worrying about margins, right? It, there, there is an element of creativity in terms of what I do um, from a business development perspective with our collaborations. It's like, I'm, I'm building these collaborations with different companies like Nike, Jordan Brand, SoulCycle, Uber, Amex, right? So I'm, I'm working with them very closely um, and, and figuring out like how to, how to do these collaborations. But that said, it's like, when you, when you go into these meetings initially, it's like, depending on who the who the, the person is that you're meeting with, it's like, there are those stereotypes that people will just fall back to you. Like, oh, you know, you're Asian, you're, you're you, it's, a, it's a sense that you feel where you don't necessarily feel welcomed as being an equal to them. And yeah, and, and that's, that's a real challenge and that's disappointing, right? Um, but I think within the fashion community, certainly now it's like there are more fashion designers who are Asian these days. But when you really think about it, it's like that emergence of Asian fashion designers, it's, it's been very recent, right? And, and it's been in a very specific type of a price point where, where those Asians have been. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think that there are very distinct challenges. And certainly for me, it's like I faced that stuff. It's never been sort of racism where it's been like so overt, but it's definitely something where it's just like, you, you don't, you, you're not made to feel like equals to, to certain other people. And that's, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me as I'm sure it does with um, a lot of our audience. Um, can you, can either of you speak more to, you know, whenever you, you kind of get that feeling. And again, to your point, Alan, it's never like, overt racism or anything like so appalling but just like this sense or this feeling that you know in your gut like what it's about and that it's about some sort of otherness you know whether you're Asian or another race or you know LGBTQ or a woman or like some combination of those things um do you how do you other than of course being professional and still getting on with whatever your meeting's about what do you do then sort of like to kind of emotionally, you know, fortify yourself or, you know, get ready for that next meeting or make sure that you still can go through that meeting and be yourself and do a good job and not like, you know, let that, let bitterness or, you know, disappointment or anything show through like any advice for that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's just sort of like sticking to your guns and being strong about it. And it's, it's hard, right? Um, I don't think we, we were, as Asian Americans, I don't know that we were necessarily built that way to, to be strong about it and have pride in terms of what we do. It's, you know, we've, we've sort of, we, we've grown up with this mentality where it's just like, you know, don't cause any trouble, just put your head down, just, just do your work. Um, but, you know, one, one of the things that I always say about, about us as, as Asian Americans is we're, we don't do a great job of marketing ourselves, right? And because we don't do a great job of marketing ourselves, 
that allows other folks to, you know, in a sense, hold us back um, because we're not loud. We don't, we're not showy. We don't pat our own, we don't pat ourselves on our back like, you know, some other folks will do. And, you know, inevitably, I think within, especially within the creative field, I think it's like one of those situations where if you create more noise, then somehow it, it, it validates who you are. Right. And if you if you just sort of scream a little bit louder then people who are around you will be like, well, this person must be the real deal, because why else would they have the guts to scream a little bit louder? So, you know, for me, it's like I try to do that where I, I try to have the guts to scream a little bit louder, where where I try to sort of validate what it is that I do and demonstrate to people that that what it is that I do and who I am is valuable. And, and, and I put myself on the same level as other people. And, you know, while it's hard, it's like, I try not to be shy about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I think in, in a lot of our prep calls with 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 Alan, that's something, you know, I, I found quite inspiring, because I, for me, that's absolutely something I'm still working through. Uh, how do I feel comfortable being Asian, especially in industries that are predominantly white, you know, you go to any art fair, uh, in Europe or the U.S., and you know you're going to be one of a hundred, one Asian out of a hundred people in, in the room. And so, I think it, it's hard to find that confidence. But I think exactly to Alan's point, being just being the, the loud one, I think actually does make a big difference. Um, I think it's something I thought about a lot with Clubhouse being very popular recently. Uh, you know, especially with the art industry, there's one of the criticisms is that there's a lot of people who actually don't know what they're talking about. But because they have, you know, because they're constantly on Clubhouse, uh, they're the ones getting the attention. And, you know, people, other people don't know any better. So they, they listen and they believe that these are the uh, people speaking the truth. But that's exactly what I mean by just doing a better job of marketing ourselves, right? We don't always do that because we don't want to present ourselves in that kind of way where we're always talking. But like you, like you said, it's like the more you talk, sort of, it, it, it validates who you are and your and your authority within your industry. Um, and you know, Gary, you brought up Clubhouse. I know we've talked about Instagram, but Gary, can you say a little more? And then Alan, can you expound more on just how in the day to day, like thinking about marketing yourselves or marketing your brands or like getting educated, how are you using social media in what you do in your job? Yeah, I mean, social media is really the foundation of, of what I do. Uh, right now, you know, Art Drunk's primary platform is Instagram. There is just over 100,000 followers. Um, you know, that, that took a, over the course of five, six years to get to, to those numbers. And now it's like trying to pivot and figure out, oh, how do we develop YouTube? How do we develop a website? Uh, how do we develop a newsletter strategy? And so I think at the end of the day, I, I, the way I've treated Instagram and social media is really about community building where I think it's, it's given me a platform, uh, at least the way I write about art is generally from a very personal place. I'll look at a painting, look at a sculpture and write about how I feel. Uh, doesn't matter the context of that piece, but it's just like, what, how do I interpret it? And that's, I think, what people really resonate with. And so uh, being open about mental health issues, race issues, those sorts of things, you really quickly find that there's a lot of other people who uh, relate to these stories. And um, I think it was funny, there's, there's one video I saw, just a very short video on Instagram the other day of like um, one guy saying, you know, people get disappointed if they get 30 views on a video, but if you imagine 30 people just walking into your room right now to watch what you're doing, that's, you know, you'd be quite freaked out. And so any sort of voice on these platforms is, is a, an opportunity to connect with people. And, uh, I've certainly been able to take advantage for building my own company. And I certainly encourage others to, you know, just reach out. I, I almost always respond to DMs from, from people. Uh, and I, I certainly know a lot of other, you know, bigger platforms do as well. So if there's like a story or a person that you resonate with, use it uh, to meet them, use it to, to, to learn more about their story and hopefully uh, find ways to connect with, um, with them yourself. That's great, Alan. How about you? I agree. I mean, social is so key from you know from a from a from a, from the perspective of it being in a creative industry. Um, 
you know, for, for my brand public school, we, we use socialize as our primary way where we to communicate with people, right? That and our email newsletter are like the two main ways that we communicate. Um, funny enough, it's like people ask, you know, are you active on Facebook? Are you active on Twitter? The reality is, is like for, for us being a fashion brand, Instagram is, that is really the only medium that matters. Um, Twitter is actually completely useless to us, right? But that said, it's like, you've got to pick and choose which is the proper medium for, for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, using Instagram is, is really great within the creative industry and, and sort of the thing that re- that works the best for us is, is being able to leverage Instagram to give that behind the scenes or that sort of more candid view into who we are as a brand and what we enjoy. It's, it's that less polished perspective because I think within a creative field, oftentimes the image that we want to project oftentimes it's really perfect. It's really planned. It's really polished. But at the same time, it's like you use something like Instagram, especially Instagram stories. This is a way for you to just give that behind the scenes where, yeah, the video quality isn't very good. Your hand is a little bit shaky, but people love seeing that kind of stuff because it it injects sort of your personality into your brand that the polished view doesn't really give. Um, but personally, it's for me, it's it's the same thing. I think social is really important for you know me building my own personal brand. Um, you know, I'm decently active on there, and I think that it's important for me to to show that. Um, you know, and just like Gary said, it's like if there's any like social issues or mental health issues and just other sort of non-professional issues, like social is a good way to connect with people. Um, from a career perspective, it's it's the same sort of thing for me. It's like I'll reach out to people on DM. I'll just sort of cold reach out to people. And again, it's like, it's just having the guts to, to reach out to people. And it's like, use whatever means necessary to, to get in touch with people. And like Gary said, it's like, you'd be surprised how many people will DM you back. I should just start DMing people tonight. Like I <laughs> literally never DM someone I have, I don't know. So <laughs> also Alan, you've never DM'd me. I'm just kidding. But you <laughs> though. So there's a question from the chat that I wanted to bring up. So Brandon C wants to know with regards to what you've seen in your respective industries as time has gone on and Gary, I know for you, it hasn't been so long, but have you seen a growing presence of Asians in the arts in kind of all forms, whether it's the actual artists, like the painters themselves, you know, as fashion designers, Alan, I know you referenced, and I know exactly who you're talking about, like kind of this recent influx of Asian designers around like one certain price point. Yeah. But um, have you, have you seen that start to grow or do you still feel a bit like you're kind of lone trailblazers here? Hmm. I think it's definitely growing. I think, you know, sort of at the, at the, at the college level, there are a lot more Asians who are studying fashion design, whereas I think in the past, Asians would go to these fashion schools to study like pattern making or production, um, technical design, rather than being on the frontline creative side of things. And I think the more Asians that get into that field or get into the creative side of things, then, then yeah, we'll see a, a, another wave of creatives that are, that are coming about. Um, you know, one of the participants who was actually supposed to be a part of this panel, she's, she, she's a fashion designer. And funny enough, it's like, we, we share some common friends. We don't actually know each other, but we share some common friends who are within the fashion field. Um, but yeah, I definitely see it as something that's growing and it's, it's exciting because I, I think the interesting thing about the the rise of Asians within within fashion and other creative industries is here we are we're sort of bringing our cultures that that we grew up with and and merging that with you know American culture so it's it's a really different lens in which things are being viewed yeah I I think it's with with art it's I mean like you said I've only been in this for a couple years so it's harder for me to say the, the the progression over time but I think recently there's certainly more attention, only in the past two months, much more attention on Asian artists and supporting Asian artists because of Asian uh, hate crimes. But I think, uh, interestingly, just yesterday, one of the largest galleries in the world uh, launched a new platform for selling art. It's not Asian specific, but one of the, uh, I guess, executives at that platform is an Asian woman who came from tech. And so I think as the art industry expands beyond its more traditional realm, 
of physical gallery spaces and more into the digital space, I think it actually opens up a lot more careers that uh, poor Asians have more opportunities to, to, to play a role. Uh, I think in the past or earlier today, when I said a lot of people who work in the art industry come from wealthier white black backgrounds, uh, that's because of that very traditional model. But as soon as they're starting to open up new platforms, um, you know, new video needs, new art, just different type of creative needs, uh, and certainly tech needs, I think, you know, I have tons of Asian friends who work in tech and who, who can actually play a key role in a lot of what these galleries want to do. So I, I think it's definitely changing, not as fast as I would, would like, but I think certainly that's where uh, I feel like I have responsibility to help support that and enable uh, more Asian creatives. So certainly like whenever I'm looking for videographers, trying to look for Asian videographers uh, to give them more opportunities to, to explore this, this industry. The last lifestyle photo shoot I did was right, um, kind of right before the pandemic started, like full week lifestyle shoot. And it was the first time that the creative director and like his second in command from an agency, like a big WPP agency um, were Asian. And it was very exciting. I have to say it was excellent work, which is to say that like anyone I'm sure like at a WPP agency level that's like coming on a, a global brand's lifestyle shoot would be excellent. But it was interesting for me because it was the first time I'd ever had any creative director who was not white and then let alone his second in command was also Asian. So they brought like a wonderful luxurious perspective which is what we wanted to the brand for the brand anyway. So it was it was perfect and it is a it is a nice experience. I personally have seen a little bit of that influx on like the agency creative side where previously I think kind of like Alan touched on this like they were more in, like I noticed that a lot of like the Asian names were kind of CC'd like sort of back room roles where like they were maybe like producing some of the things like after they'd been given all the directives and they were like churning it, but they weren't like the director, like ideating around the big ideas or the strategist. So it's exciting to see that. Um, you both touched on, you know, kind of the, the sense of responsibility around supporting minority and Asian and Asian American artists. Um, I know that, um, and, and Gary, you talked about this too, with the, the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans and just anti-Asian sentiment in the whole country over the last 14 months that a lot of us um, are interested in supporting minority and particularly um, Asian owned businesses and brands. So from an arts perspective, uh, my friends and I have like a WhatsApp list, but I'm sure it's not as you know extensive as what you all could share if there's any resources you could share of lists or just like any brands that you'd recommend. I mean, I'm biased, throw it in the chat if you've got anything that you want, but like, I'm all about like women's wear and like beauty. So, you know, if you've got any of that or just any general references, I think we'd all appreciate that. So we could support those, those designers, those brands, those artists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, just a, a few things. I mean, I think it's, it's, I, I'm still trying to find these resources myself too. I think it's, you know, when, something I've thought about a lot is when Black Lives Matter uh, last year was particularly at, at the height of the movement, uh, you know, immediately I saw my friends sharing all these lists of black owned businesses and black artists to support, uh, black creatives to support. And, you know, recently with this influx of Asian hate crime, I'm not seeing as much of that. You know, I, I don't think, I think this is part of what Alan has talked to talked about quite a lot of like, there isn't quite that community yet of people being able to speak or people comfortable speaking out and creating that uh, community of support. Uh, so it's not, I, I don't think those resources are as readily available. Uh, so even for me, for example, like when I want to find Asian artists, it really still goes back to just who do I happen to know or who like just keeping in, you know, the, occasionally you'll see lists from media platforms like Artsy where they'll do a list of top 10 Asian artists to, to watch for 2021. Like that's almost the extent of what I see of, uh, of resources specific to Asian artists. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's museums and organizations like Asia Society, Guggenheim uh, will usually has an Asian focused show every one to two years. So, you know, that becomes a resource to uh, learn more. And of course they'll have programming around uh, the shows. Uh, but also I think, a lot of artists uh, and creatives are intertwined with food and just culture in general. And so I think by virtue of supporting 
those local businesses uh, or just you know supporting the the more accessible uh, place outlets, I guess, uh, you know, just going to a local Chinese restaurant to buy food, I do think that inherently will support the community. Ellen? Yeah, I mean, for, you know, one of the things that we touched on in one of the, in one of the prep calls was, you know, this, this idea of food. And I actually had dinner with, with some friends who I grew up with last night. And, you know, I was saying how, like, Anthony Bourdain was was so amazing because he he was able to use food to unite people and you know eating delicious stuff everyone loves eating delicious stuff right but it's like what he was able to do with that was take it a step further by putting it into cultural context and I think once if if you can find that medium to allow people to become curious about Asian culture, it's like, that's a real win. And, and that's why it's like, it, we, were ju- we were just saying how it was like such a shame that he passed because he here he is as a white man who's able to create this bridge amongst cultures via food. And yeah, I mean, that that's kind of it, right? It's like, if you go out and support your local, you know, Asian food places that are, you know, those authentic places that, Generally speaking, these are mom and pop places where it could be like a husband and wife team who are working it. It could be a father and son team. It's like here in New York, it's like you've got Xi'an Famous Foods. That has grown into, you know, a pretty decent sized chain, right? But here, here it is where it's Chinese food. But from, for the typical American, they would look at it and be like, well, geez, this isn't the Chinese food that I'm used to. So then all of a sudden, it opens it up and allows you to explore. It's like, well, what is this stuff? Where is it from? Why is it different than what I'm accustomed to? So I think, yeah, I, I mean, if, if there's more of these types of resources, then yeah, we can all sort of dive a little bit deeper and, and learn a little bit more. But yeah, it's, it's certainly one of those things where, you know, one of the things that we said earlier, it's like, there isn't that sort of master list or this directory of, Asian owned businesses where we can say, Hey, you know, pinpoint and say, these are, these are the types of companies that we support. You know, one of my friends, Aurora, she, um, you know, she founded the 15% pledge and this was all around this, the black lives matter movement where, you know, here she is, she, she was a fashion designer and she started this 15% pledge and basically was calling out every single damn company out there saying black people make up 15% of the U S population. All I'm asking is that you give them 15% of the shelf space in your store, right? And she's flipped a lot of these retailers to be able to give that 15% of their shelf space. I don't see the same thing happening within the Asian community. And I think that that goes back to one of the things that we said earlier is like, we don't want to speak up in that kind of way. And, you know, I think it comes back to as Asian Americans, we don't, we don't feel entitlement and, maybe it's time that we do start to feel some entitlement because we're deserving of it. So let's speak up and start asking for this stuff. Right, I think that's uh, that's a kind of a, a perfect note to end on, but let's, you know, regardless of, you know, race or industry, gender, Alan's right, let's start speaking up and asking for all these things, right? Like it's, it's worked for, for a lot of other people and Alan and Gary definitely have leveraged it for their success in an industry that's very hard to succeed in and become very successful. So I think that's, that's good advice for all of us. And I personally take that, I'll take that to heart as well. (laughs) Take it back to the, to the marketing boardroom. Thank you so much. And Alan and Gary, it was really a pleasure. I'm going to connect with you and DM you. And now that you've said that you will answer these mystery DMs. Yeah, exactly. Now you can't say no. (laughs) Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Alan and Gary. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye. Bye.